This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and we are continuing our study in the book of Daniel. But before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our sins, that we are controlled by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. We had just seen our young men delivered not from the fiery furnace, but through the fiery furnace. We often prefer as believers to be delivered out of a tough situation rather than have to go through it at all. And sometimes God does that. But like these young men, there are times that we are to go through the tougher of the two tests, and that is to be delivered through the fire. But just as these young men did in those days, we never go through the fire alone. God was not only with them, but literally with them, assuming this was a Christophany. A very, very valuable lesson. Sometimes in our spiritual growth, we are ready to take a major step forward in our faith, in our spiritual growth. We are ready to be shaped in a major way through this type of testing. Somewhere Christians have gotten the idea that the Christian life is all about comfort. That God wants us comfortable. That a mature Christian is one who is surrounded by being comfortable. Everything under control. Everything going his or her way. Prosperous. Healthy. Little or no suffering. And when there's something that's not going right, they want to blame the devil. Now that neither matches up with the lives of the saints nor what the scripture teaches. But I also want to make it clear the Christian life is not all about suffering, not at all. It is about faith. Is it about trusting God in all circumstances, whether things are going really hard or quite easy? And scripture teaches that Christians will suffer. That's part of the growth process. That is how we are strengthened in our faith. So we trust God at even higher levels. We are to live by faith, whether through suffering or in prosperity and in good health. The heroes among believers are marked by living by faith in the midst of trials and prosperity. Now don't miss that second part, in prosperity. They trusted God in all kinds of circumstances. <clears throat> it seems that also we've picked up along the line where the real test of faith is through suffering. That's often where the stories are, in the lion's den, in the furnace, uh, the list of things that Paul went through, then being imprisoned and beaten, and, and yes, that is suffering, and yes, that is living by faith. But there are also times when God wants us to trust him even in prosperity. David was a prosperous Christian. So was his son. 
David had some problems with prosperity, and certainly his son did. But let's keep a balance when we think about when it comes to living by faith. Prosperity is also one of the most difficult tests. What a test it is to come into a lot of money and finding yourself not having to do what you normally do and pretty soon you're out of your routine of studying your scriptures, of your prayer, of spending time with your fellow believers because the world has so much to offer. <clears throat> now Hebrews gives a list of heroes of the faith in chapter 11. And you might want to read through those now and then and remind yourself of the believers and the various circumstances in which they had to live by faith. Some for a whole lifetime look forward to spending time with God. Life on earth wasn't pleasant. But at the same time, some believers, as I said, were quite prosperous. Abraham was another good example. Many of the believers we see list, listed in Scripture were leaders in some capacity. Think of uh, even Samson was a judge. Samuel was a prophet. Let me read portion a portion of Hebrews beginning in chapter 11, verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. And you can see here that there are all kinds of settings for believers living by faith. All kinds of societal rankings. I underline the phrase who weakness, whose weakness was turned to strength. That's one of the keys when it comes to growing by faith. An area of our weakness is tested. And when we pass that test, we are strengthened. When God is going to mold us in a major way, it takes great testing. Now, our passage in Daniel is one of those accounts where we get to see God working directly in the lives of his obedient people. And when he does so, he draws in near. He comes up close where you get to experience the peace that surpasses all understanding and walk with the Lord hand in hand. This is exactly what our friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They could not be in a more hostile environment. This is not a violent storm ripping your house away, of a fire burning through your neighborhood, hostile enemy tanks barreling through your house with you on the run. But this is the very country and king you have faithfully served. Now these young men have probably been doing this for maybe four years now. They had graduated with honors in the academy. They were following uh, the way of their countrymen and the way they served at such a high level. Here we see the very city, the very co-workers that they work with 
turning on them. And the authority who you obeyed has decided to sentence you to a miserable, torturous death. Now this is a tremendous turnabout in these young men's lives. You think you're doing so well, even in this type of environment, and then something comes up to turn that whole situation on its head. Now, folks, there are some important things to learn here. Nothing is ever going to be steady. That's one of those areas where we think we want comfort. We just want everything just going on routine. That'll happen for a period of time, but then something like this can happen. And everything changes. Think of it. They were comfortable in the sense that they had a good position in the government. And you could say everything was paid for. Health insurance. They had their housing. Their food was taken care of. They got to attend the best of parties. See the best entertainment. But now it comes down to a challenge of their faith and obedience. Well, these young men were in the fire walking with a divine being. I think it was the Lord himself. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar is taken by, taken by a big surprise. He wants to get a closer look. Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar approached the opening of the furnace of blazing fire. He called out and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. Notice that the fire was still blazing. So in a voice louder than the fire, the raging fire, Nebuchadnezzar calls the young man to come out. Calls him by name. Calls them servants of the Most High God. Certainly that's an acknowledgement of someone much bigger than not only Nebuchadnezzar, but much greater than his own gods. Something much bigger is involved here, and he knew it. He had never seen anything like it. There was nothing even heard of this amazing. And there it was right before his eyes. Now he calls them the servants of the Most High God. This calls us back to what he said after Daniel had interpreted his dream back in chapter 2 when he called Daniel's God, God of gods and Lord of kings. You see, for a moment Nebuchadnezzar had gotten his eyes off of himself and on the one with the power behind this miracle. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the midst of the fire. The fire is still going on. It looks like it continued to go on right after they came out, so it didn't stop. Verse 27. Once the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around, they saw that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor were the hair of their heads singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor was there the smell of fire on them. Now, these satraps and prefects and big shots, I added that one, were all there to see these young men burn for disobeying the king. But instead, they got to witness 
a miracle of the Most High God. You see, these young men were going to get it because they defied the order of the king. But in fact, it went right back into their face, so to speak, as they got to become front row witnesses to the power of the God of the Jews. We get a short list here of what they witnessed. There's some details here. First, the fire had no effect on the young men whatsoever. Their skin wasn't even reddened by the heat. Their clothes weren't even singed. Not even a hair on their head was singed. And we know that it doesn't take a lot of heat for hair to crinkle up and start to smell. That didn't even happen. And then with all this clothing on, the clothing didn't begin to burn not even a brown spot. And then there was not even the smell of fire on them. And have you ever worked around campfires or firewood or even a, a fireplace? You know it doesn't take long for things to start smelling like smoke. And they had been inside this fiery furnace for a length of time. And not the faintest odor. So that's a testimony in itself that God wasn't going to let any of this affect them at all. Now, moments before these three were tied up, bound in ropes, and tossed in the fire like logs, now they stand before their king, fully dressed, and their fancy garb that they had for this entire ceremony and the king speaks verse 28 Nebuchadnezzar responded and said blessed be the God of Shadrach Meshach and Abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Well, you see, he's got it kind of right here, doesn't he? Except for probably not quite understanding the angel and who that was. He basically summarizes the situation. He first praises the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A good thing to do, especially under these circumstances. Uh, a powerful man like himself would want to recognize someone more powerful. He says their God sent an angel. Early had said this same person appeared like a son of the gods. And that word they use is a word that can be used for angel or messenger or even deity for that matter. In fact, it's the same letters as in the Hebrew. The word is malek. Remember, this is the Aramaic. Same letters, but the vowels, that is the signs underneath the larger letters, they're different in the Hebrew. But he was right. He saw some sort of divine being. He knew something outside the natural had happened. No one could deny that. This was certainly a supernatural being. And now, once he calls, he calls the three out of the fire, the supernatural being is gone. doesn't say what happened. And Nebuchadnezzar recognizes, as he just stated, that the, these young men put their trust in God. Now recall how they made a point of this earlier before they were thrown in. That they were going to trust their God, whether God had them die in there or deliver them. So Nebuchadnezzar 
understands what happened. He understands that these young men did trust their God. And as an unbeliever, he saw what their God could do. God had allowed them to be put in this situation, in this position. And whether they lived or died, they had already told the king their position on this. They were not going to bow down to that statue. And the king even says they violated the king's command. And that's, that reinforces what actually happened here. They clearly went against the authority, and a very powerful one at that. Nebuchadnezzar knew they were putting their life on the line when they did that. And not only that, they had really made him mad by saying what they did. And don't forget that this is some of his, you might call, lieutenants in his uh, court. They were officials, not the highest ranking, but probably somewhere in the middle. And he knew they were honoring their God by defying him. And we might say today, well, he was put in his place. But sad to say, his heart still doesn't change, as we shall see. And an interesting thing that he admits is that they did the right thing for them. And he says so. They violated the king's command. They yielded up their bodies so they would not worship or serve any other god except their own. Yes, he got it right. They had completely given themselves over to God. By the way, that's really the concept of carrying the cross. That's the idea behind counting the cost. You're willing to do whatever it takes to follow Jesus, and that's the call that Jesus calls us all to even before we become saved. Are you willing to do that? Because it could come to that. Now, one of the things that Nebuchadnezzar was impressed by was not only the power of the God, but these young men. They had stood their ground against him. And I think we can respect Nebuchadnezzar for that because he at least understands at this point when someone stands on principle and they go this far with it, that's something to admire. Remember, these men were probably 20, 21 years old at most. And they stood against him, against all the other officials in the empire, and were publicly out in the open about their beliefs. They weren't what some might call closet Christians. They were not only willing to speak up, but to stand for principle. That's another important lesson. Anytime the believer is commanded to disobey God, you disobey that command. We never disobey God. That's always the bottom line. We never sin in order to obey the authority over us. Verse 29. Now another decree comes forth from the king, this one in favor of our young men. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
shall have their limbs torn off and their houses reduced to rubbish heap. For there exists no other God who can deliver in this way. Well, doesn't all that sound familiar? The threat has turned around. Now the threat of having their limbs torn off and their house turned to rubbish is towards those who do not honor the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And look at what he says, for there exists no other God who can deliver in this way. And remember the words that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had used earlier? Our God exists and he can do this if he wants to. So Nebuchadnezzar had laid down the challenge and these young men simply did what they thought was right and God backed them up. Now, let's point out a couple of things here. The first line, therefore, <clears throat> I make a decree that any people, nation, or language, this tells us that, or tongue, this tells us, that, tells us that those who had gathered had come from all over the empire. Now, these people who had witnessed this and heard this new order would go back out into the empire, hundreds of miles away, all different directions, and spread the word about what happened. And that would be backed up when people would ask, well, why did Nebuchadnezzar issue that order? They could tell the story. What a testimony that was in those days for this word would spread all around the empire what the God, had, God of the Jews had done for these Judeans. And they must have wondered, well then why would that God allow their country to be overrun in the first place? Well, if they wanted that deep of an understanding, they'd probably have to talk to these young Jews themselves. Well, this seems to change the way things are going to be for the Jews. They're going to be respected to some degree by the Babylonians. Um, the trend seems to be in favor of the Jews. In another 50 years or so, they will be releasing the Jews back into the land, though it will be by the country that conquers Babylon, the Persians. The empire at the time of Babylon stretched all the way to central Turkey, down into Egypt east to Persia, what we would call Iran. And the news must have spread quickly. This was headline news. And the people who were spreading the news would be the officials of the Babylonian government. Not something you would expect to hear from them. Can you imagine when they got back to the area of Judea? And it got into the ears of some of those Judeans who had been overrun by the Babylonians a few years earlier. And now they find these Babylonian officials coming back and saying, they're talking about our God. Or Jeremiah, if you're still alive at the time, down in Egypt, they're talking about our God. Now the basis of this decree that King Nebuchadnezzar sent out was that no one was to speak anything offensive. Literally, it means negligent, to say anything erroneous about the God of Israel. To say something wrong about the God of Israel or towards the God of the Jews, 
this is a way to get the word out, perhaps to get others to turn back to God. Remember, the Jewish people were God's people still. And it may be also this becomes the beginning of the turnaround for God's people to come back to God. In the meantime, those around them, even their captors, are told to show respect by respecting his name. You see, that was something that was probably loaded with some superstition, but at the same time, when you respected a God, you didn't say anything bad about his name. And when I come across a point like this, it is a reminder of what has happened in our culture in the United States where one of the most common expressions and that that has become one of the acceptable norms is a blasphemous disrespectful use of the name of God in common conversation and the entertainment industry OMG. That's become accepted among children and adults. And you can't you can hardly turn on the television on any kind of entertainment without them using this phrase in one form or another. You see, the scripture says that the name of God represents his person. So his name is to be respected and always properly used. Whether a person knows what they're saying or not when they misuse the term for God or Jesus or Christ or some combination, it is sin. It's a misuse of God's name. In our passage, a pagan king knew you do not say things or any way disrespect the God of Israel. No one who knows anything about the creator of heaven and earth who believes that they have any idea who he is has any business with this type of expression. No Christian has any business using the terms Lord or God or Jesus or Christ in some sort of profane manner. Now, it's certainly understandable to call for God for help in prayer or in desperation or one is about to uh, go into a death, uh, life or death situation people call on God's name but that's not what I'm talking about and I think everybody knows what I'm talking about but to use God's name as some expression of excitement or reaction is a total misuse and blasphemous use of God's name how would you like to have uh, Nebuchadnezzar's penalty as law in the United States. They shall have their limbs torn off and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap for there exists no other God who can deliver in this way. What if that was a penalty? I think we'd see heaps of houses all over the place. And then again, for there exists no other God who can deliver in this way. Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the miraculous. This was, an, this was an astounding deliverance. And God let him have a front row seat, not only that, participate in it. 
And who would have believed it except those who had seen it? And now who's going to doubt, doubt, now listen to this, who's going to doubt the king of the empire and several layers of his high officials? They had seen the power behind the God of these young Jews. You see, even though they've seen this power and they've seen these miracles, they can respect that. They don't want to burn. They don't want that God against them. But even with all these uh, miracles that just happened in this short story. They still don't turn to God. There's no massive evangelistic movement here. There's no heart change among the Babylonian people. In fact, in about 50 years, their time will come as a nation and they will go down as did Judah, as did Assyria. Now there's no excuse. They knew there was a God, they knew there was a greater power, and they had seen miracles. But that doesn't change their heart. So don't ever think that just because people see miracles that that's going to convince them. In fact, miracles often become a way in which people are misled, especially in our day when people claim to have false miracles. And they're always chasing miracles, always got these miracle stories. And yet, that doesn't add to your spiritual growth. It's not even convincing for people to be saved. They still, in their heart, have to change and say, that they want to turn to God and then do so. Now another thing. When Nebuchadnezzar issued this order, in one sense he just turned his whole religious system of worshiping the image that he had made on its head. Now people are in trouble if they disrespect the God of those Judeans. We often look at these, these historical accounts as little Bible stories for children. But there's some major lessons here for adults. We need to understand the power of God and that God wants to be respected. And as believers, we should demand that first in our own lives and with those around us. But at the same time, realize that God will deal with the offenders. It's not our place to penalize them. God will deal with them. But it is our place when we have the opportunity to tell them the truth of the matter. We do not worship other gods. We do not bow down to any images. We worshiped. We worship the God of Israel. Well, as usual, Nebuchadnezzar does what he does when he sees someone who has a God greater than his. He promotes and he prospers the one whom God has used. And simply put, Nebuchadnezzar was a man who lived by power, who respected power, and now he's witnessed power for greater than his, and he will honor that power by promoting these young men. Verse 30. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. Well, here we go again. Remember the first time they got their uh, first set of promotions? 
when Daniel had interpreted those, that dream, told the dream and interpreted it a few years earlier. And now they get kind of a reboot, you might say, after this event. Now let me give you another simple lesson, one that we know, but I think we all need to be reminded. When it comes to obeying God, we never lose out. It is never to our disadvantage to obey God. It is never to our disadvantage to choose not to sin. In this case, these men were prospered. They may have gotten more income, better housing, better clothes, higher ranks. A lot of these things would come to them as a result of how Nebuchadnezzar viewed what they did and interpreted the power behind their God. At one point, death was staring them in the face. But when you truly know God, And you get in a situation where you don't know what's going on. Or you may ask yourself, why is this happening? And a question I've asked myself, why is this so hard? You put it in God's hands and you leave it there. This is a complete turnabout of events. during the Maccabean Revolt. The story of the courage of these young men were spoken about when God worked in their lives as we just witnessed. Now the book of Maccabees of course is not the inspired word of God, it's a uh, historical account and of course there's questions about its accuracy. But let me read a portion of it as it recalls this story. In fact, I'm going to read a pretty good portion of it. 1 Maccabees 2.49. Now, again, this is written by a man by the name of Josephus. He was a Jewish historian. And here's what he writes. Now when the time, this is in 1 Maccabees 2.49. Now when the time drew near that Mattathias should die. Now this was the father of the sons who led the revolt against the Greeks. He said unto his sons, Now hath pride and rebuke gotten strength in the time of destruction and the wrath of indignation. Now therefore, my sons, be ye zealous for the law. Remember they were still under the Mosaic law. And give your lives for the covenant of your fathers. Call to remembrance what acts our fathers did in their time. So shall ye receive great honor in an everlasting name. Was not Abraham found faithful in temptation, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness? Joseph, in the time of his distress, kept the commandment and was made lord of Egypt. Phineas, our father, in being zealous and fervent about the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Jesus, for fulfilling the, Lord, the word, was made a judge in Israel. That's not the Lord Jesus. That's another one. Caleb, for bearing witness before the congregation, receiving the heritage of the land. David, for being merciful, possessed the throne of an everlasting kingdom. There's the Davidic promise. Eliza, that's uh, Elisha, by the way, Elias is Elisha, for being zealous and fervent for the law, was taken up into heaven. Here's our boys. Ananias, Azarias, and Mishael, by believing, were saved out of the flame. An upcoming story, the next one. Daniel, for his innocency, was delivered from the mouth of lions. There's more. 
And thus consider ye throughout all ages that none that put their trust in him shall be overcome. Fear not then the words of a sinful man, for his glory shall be dung and worms. Today he shall be lifted up, and tomorrow he shall not be found, because he has returned into his dust, and his thought is come to nothing. Wherefore, ye, my sons, be valiant, and show yourselves men in behalf of the law, for by it for by it shall ye obtain glory. And behold, I know that your brother Simon is a man of counsel. Give ear unto him always. He shall be a father unto you. As for Judas Maccabeus, another one of the sons, he hath been mighty and strong even from his youth up. Let him be your captain and fight the battle of the people. Take also unto you all those who that observe the law, and avenge ye the wrong your peop of your people. Recompense fully the heathen, and take heed to the commandments of the law. So he blessed them, and he was gathered to his fathers. And he died in the hundred and forty and sixth year. And his sons buried him in the sepulchres of his fathers at Modin. And all Israel made great lamentation for him. Then his son Judas, called Maccabeus, rose up in his stead. Well, whatever you think about the Maccabeans and their revolt against the Greek, against the Greeks, there is something to be said for the stories that we've just read and how it inspired the Jewish people. And so the story of these young men that we've just read standing up to the most powerful king in the world at that time and depending on their God for whatever his will may be. That is a lesson that we all need to learn and never forget because that day may come and we too may have to face life or death for our faith. It's no accident this story is in the scripture. and We have it in such detail and sometimes vivid detail. And it's a lesson for young and old to always remember. Do God's will and his will will be done in your life. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for this great account of three of our heroes of Scripture. And Lord, might we learn to live by faith at the level they did. Many of, you, many of us are far beyond their young age. But there are some great lessons from these young men that we all need to learn that we follow you at all cost and at all times and that we never forget that you're the great God of heaven whose power is beyond anything else whether in the heavens or in the earth and so we ask that you will challenge us in the power of your spirit for us to remember these principles as times in our life get tough we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.